we've been looking at a number of things in Matthew 16 in relation to building a new covenant church. As I said, this is the first time that the word church occurs in the Bible, in the New Testament. It's a New Testament concept. There was no church in the Old Testament. It's something that Jesus introduced in the New Covenant. And uh, I find that lots and lots of Christians don't have an understanding of it. Now, that's not surprising because the devil's main aim is to blind us to as much of God's truth as possible. I mean, he'll first of all try to blind us to the forgiveness of sins, which he succeeded in blinding millions and billions of people around the world. If they knew that truth, they would be free. Just like Jesus said, you shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free from the guilt of sin. Okay, if he didn't succeed there, that means you somehow broke through and got some light on how your sins can be forgiven. Then that's not all the truth there is in the Bible. The Bible speaks of the whole counsel of God. Now you, got, you may have got a small segment of that circle. And then the devil will seek to blind you to as much as possible. You break through to an overcoming life. And a lot of people think that's it. I've really got everything there is in the Christian life now. I met numerous people who never become a submissive member of any local church, which is an expression of the body of Christ. They flit from church to church to church, like visiting Chinese restaurants and Telugu restaurants and different restaurants. Um, in search of food. Now the church is not a restaurant, it's a family. And many people don't want to accept the responsibilities in a family. Human, one of the uh, characteristics of the human race is we like to have privilege without responsibility. You see that in teenagers, you see that in grown-ups. We want all the privileges, all the blessings that God can give us, but we don't want to take any responsibility until we see how Jesus lived and then we change, we take up the cross and then we realize that responsibility is a major part of the Christian life. And then we shall not flit from church to church. We shall become a committed part of a local church. But again, like I said, um, if we don't break through, we'll remain blind. It's not something that I can explain to you or convince you about. I think of Paul writing to the Ephesians, and he says, I pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. Now, he didn't say, just read my epistle ten times, meditate on it, study, study it, go to the root meanings of the Greek words, and you'll understand all this rubbish in the way in which people try to understand Scripture today. It's good to read Scripture a hundred times. The Pharisees read it a hundred times and still thought that Jesus was the prince of devils. What did they lack? Intelligence? No. Earnest study? No. What they lacked was humility which would have given them the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Because God in his great wisdom has hidden these truths from the clever and the intelligent. Those are Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty five, And reveal them to those who have the heart of a babe. They get revelation. So I, I've seen through the years that the church is a revelation. God opened Paul's eyes to see it, that the church was a body. I think he got that light on the road to Damascus. As he was going down that road and he heard this voice from heaven saying, Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And he began to think, he was a clever man. 
how in the world can I persecute someone who's living in heaven? And there the seed was sown in his mind of the great truth that though the head is in heaven, the body is on the earth. And when Paul persecuted Christians, he was persecuting the head. And that whole truth began to open up in his mind through the Holy Spirit. And for the rest of his life, he preached on the church as a body of Christ. And wherever he went, he didn't have the passion to save souls like today people have. He had a passion to build the church. Saving souls is like getting a finger and throwing it there and getting a leg and throwing it there like the anatomy laboratory in medical colleges. It's not a body. But I've seen through the years, unless a person's eyes are open, you can speak to them for years. They'll never understand it. I'm not here to judge them, but I know the reason is the lack of humility. Anyone who's got humility will get revelation on the whole truth of God. The more you humble yourself, the more God opens, opens your eyes. Cleverness will never lead you there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean upon your own understanding, it says, if you want God to direct all your paths. So we've been looking at that, the church that Jesus spoke about in verse 18, and the mark of that church is that the gates of hell, the powers of spiritual darkness will never be able to triumph over it. Any church over which the powers of darkness are triumphing, it's not the church of Jesus Christ. And when you see churches today where divorce is accepted, remarriage is accepted, pastors are remarried and divorced, what is that? That's not the church of Jesus Christ, that's the church of the devil, which claims to be the church of Jesus Christ, which has completely disregarded the commands of Christ and which treats sin lightly and think that in the 21st century we've got more wisdom than Jesus had in the first century about matters like divorce and remarriage. Well, that will always be there. Babylon will continue to be big and great. The Bible says that. It's going to end as a great institution which will finally collapse. Jerusalem may not be that big in size, but it's going to be pure in quality. And that's what we want to spend our life building, because that's the only thing that will remain. It's like Noah. Once he knew that the ark was the only thing that would remain after the flood was gone, he devoted all his attention to building the ark. He, I mean, he worked to earn his living. There was nobody to support him financially. He worked to earn his living, a great example for Christian workers today, and devoted all his time to build the ark. It's a great example. Your job must only be a means of earning a living. If you want to be like Noah in the last days and devote yourself to building the church, it's the only thing that will remain. Noah didn't just bring a lot of planks together and put it there and a whole lot of nails. That's like saving souls. He built something. He built. What's the use if he had just collected all the planks and the nails and everything else and left it there? like many evangelists do. No, he built, he built an ark. It was built one with another in unity. That's what Jesus is building today. When he built Adam, he didn't just build a hand and leave it there and a leg and leave it there. He put it together. And that's what he's doing today as well. So I want to share a little more today about what Jesus said. You know, we were looking last time at the way of the cross, which was the first time Jesus spoke about the cross. The first time he spoke about the church as well. We saw that last time. And then, you know, he also, we looked at this too in verse 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So I want to say a few words about following Christ. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, nobody, not even the greatest prophet, could say, follow me. They all said, hear the word of the Lord. Exactly like most preachers say today, don't look at me, listen to the word of God. It sounds very humble and spiritual to say, don't look at me, look at Jesus. There are a lot of ideas we get from our understanding which are totally contrary to scripture. The human understanding of humility is a million miles away from Christ-like humility. In a human understanding of humility, Christ should not have gone and whipped the money changers out of the temple. That the humble men don't do that. 
according to human understanding. But Jesus, the humblest man on earth, whipped them and he didn't just gently ask them to remove their tables. He turned the tables and sent the coins flying and he told us, Pharisees, you generation of vipers, how will you escape the damnation of hell? This is the humblest man that walked on the earth, don't forget. So if you get your definition of humility from the dictionary, you'll go completely astray. And you deserve to go astray because you don't look at Jesus, but you look at the dictionary. The Bible says we run the race looking unto Jesus. We get our understanding of humility from Christ. We get our understanding of holiness from Christ. We get our understanding of love from Christ. His love for that rich young ruler. It says he looked at him and he loved him, it says in Mark 10. And when the man was not willing to give up his money and follow Jesus, Jesus did not go after him and say, okay, let's start with 10%. We'll move on to 20%. No. Goodbye. That's love. How many people know that type of love today? Very few. Because their understanding rules their life, not the Word of God. They think their understanding is superior to God's Word. Now I'll tell you why I say that. If you really believed, let me be honest with you, if you really believed that in all the millions and billions of books in the world, there's only one book that God wrote, and you say you're a child of God, I'm amazed that you don't study it. You don't believe it. That's why. You have more time watching television. How can that be? You say nominally, the Bible is the word of God. I mean, it's like this. If, if my father was a billionaire and had written a will in my favor, I'd like to know everything written in that will. Why should all my father's hard labor and all the money he earned go to some crooked lawyer? I want to know what he wrote for me. Much more important than money is what God has written in his book for me. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, if you come to the word of God, you'll find it's very different from what a lot of preaching that you hear today. For example, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Follow me as I follow Christ. Was that pride? Or was that humility? Paul received a thousand times more grace than you and me. God does not give his grace to the proud. He gives it to the humble. And this humble man who received such fantastic grace from God, proving that he was a very humble man, probably the humblest man in his lifetime on earth, said to people, Follow me as I follow Christ. This is true new covenant leadership. It's not follow me, full stop, no. It's follow me as I follow Christ. I don't want to follow a guy who says follow me. There are a lot of false teachers saying follow me. A lot of uh, false religions leaders say follow me. But follow me as I follow Christ. This is new covenant leadership. As I said in the old covenant, it was not like this. Nobody, not even Moses or Elijah could say, follow me. Moses could say, come and hear what God has told me on the mountaintop. But please don't come and look at my family life, how I fight with my wife. And uh, we had a quarrel the other day over our son's circumcision. Don't, uh, that's not a good example. But don't look at me. Look at, hear the word of God. Preachers who preach like that are old covenant preachers. And they will build an old covenant congregation and not a new covenant church. A new covenant leader must be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. Come and examine every area of my life. Come and look at my family. Come and look at how I live with my wife. Come and look at how I brought up my children. Come and look at all of my children, not one or two. Come and look at all my financial dealings. Every single thing. You can examine all my books. Come into my house and see the books I read. Come and see how I spend my time. There's nothing to hide. Do you see why the churches are not built? New covenant churches? Because God can find so few who can lead those churches. Jesus once looked around in his day 
And he said, the people were like sheep without shepherd, and he had tremendous compassion. What did he do? Did he say, who will volunteers? Who will volunteer? Who will come and join a Bible school? We want to raise up more shepherds. All these modern methods produce third-rate, good-for-nothing, useless Christian workers. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 9, 36 to 38? He said, the harvest is plenteous. The shepherds, the laborers, the shepherds are few. It's true today. So what shall we start? More Bible schools? No, 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 no. That will only produce false prophets. Pray. Pray that Almighty God the Father will thrust forth shepherds into his harvest. The answer is in prayer. We need to learn that. That humble dependence upon God for everything. And I'll tell you, after 50 years of being a Christian and seeing Christianity in many parts of the world, the greatest need today is godly leadership. And the devil will do everything in his power to prevent you as a young man from allowing God to break you and humble you and prepare you to be a leader in God's work one day. Do you know at what age people became leaders in the Bible? Joseph was the second ruler of Egypt when he was 30 years old. Prepared for 13 years before that through trial and difficulty and tested with evil women and tested whether he would complain and grumble and all types of things. And it says the Lord was with him when he was a slave. The Lord was with him when he was a prisoner. And he, was, he went through the grind and then came out at the age of 30, more mature than a lot of 70, 80-year-old people today, prepared to be a leader. David, another young man, probably around 20 years old when he killed Goliath, had to be trained 10 years running around in caves, became the king of Israel, man after God's own heart, age 30. Daniel, probably 17, 18 years old, determined in his heart, it says in Daniel 1, 8, that he would not defile himself. Boy, I wish we had more young men, 17, 18 years old, who would determine in their heart not to be like the other young men around them, but they will not defile themselves. Because they have a respect for the word of God. Not only the big commandments like don't murder, don't steal. But the small commandments like don't look upon the wine when it is red. When it stirs itself in the cup like it says in Proverbs. And they were told they had certain laws in Leviticus concerning clean and unclean animals. Daniel decided to follow it. So these are the men in the New Testament. Jesus was 30. But he'd been trained for... 30 years before he became a leader, even Jesus, the Son of God, he had to be broken in his home by submission to imperfect parents. How do you like to submit to a boss who knows less than you, who's not upright? I know in my younger days, I had to submit to elders whom I couldn't respect as godly men. I'll tell you honestly. I could not respect them as godly men because I saw them lose their temper. I saw carnality in their life. I saw their sermons were the most boring things I ever heard on earth. How could I respect them? But the Lord said, shut your mouth and submit to them. Because I was part of that church. I did. I didn't know why. I mean, it was sort of the best church around. And the best church had leaders like that. But I tell you, it was good for me. God broke me in so many ways. When the leader would tell me to shut my mouth and sit at the back, and I sat at the back for three years. <laughs> good. It was very good for me. There were people who were jealous of my preaching and wouldn't let, give me a chance to speak. I said, okay. I'd go out into the streets and preach there. Nobody wanted to do that. I'll tell you this, in your younger days, if God lays a hold of you in your teenage years, I want to tell you in Jesus' name, 
God wants to do a tremendous work of breaking in you before you're 30. I see that throughout scripture. And if he doesn't succeed in that, you're pretty much missed the bus. What a tragedy. That's the reason why there are so few prophets in India, why there are so few shepherds after God's own heart. Because you can't be that just by, even if you're a gifted speaker, that's not good enough to be a shepherd. God has to do work in your heart. So when Jesus spoke about following him, he wanted examples who could say like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ and not people like Moses who say, don't look at my private life, just listen to what I preach. It's a great requirement of the New Covenant Church. And as we've gone around planting churches, the Lord's planted churches in India, I've always looked for God-fearing leaders. It's not easy to find them. We have to make do with whatever is available. Sometimes we have to start, a, start with a one-eyed man because he's a king among the blind. But all the others are blind. The one-eyed man is better than the rest. But it's not the best. We look for two-eyed people, but we don't find them. Then we get a one-eyed man. And some places, I just closed down the church. I say, listen, I'm not going to be responsible for this. Do what you like, go where you like. But we've tried for years to try and get godly leadership. It's not there. Forget it. I can't take any responsibility. Because where there's no shepherd, if you gather sheep together, you've just produced food for the wolves.